following excerpts are from a class in 20th century music at New York University. The instructor, Walter Reinhold, holds degrees from Westminster Choir College, Union Theological Seminary, and New York University. Professor Reinhold is well read in the areas of music history, art history, and theology. He has taught music history and style analysis on the undergraduate and graduate levels at New York University since 1968. During these 14 years, he has written 10 books and has taught over 2,000 students, many of whom have gone on to use his materials and methods in courses of their own. As illustrated in the following classroom excerpts, empirical knowledge, refined wit, and an overall love for his work combined to make Walter Reinhold's presentation most enjoyable indeed. We at Music Resources Limited feel, therefore, that his lectures would be an enriching addition to corporate humanities programs, as well as to televised arts and humanities series. For the next few minutes, you will experience a new brand of cultural entertainment. We invite you to sit back, relax, laugh, and learn. a quarter to anyone who knows what cantata that's from. 29. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. I've tried to break down American music, which, as I mentioned last week, is about the healthiest in all the countries in the 20th century because we have just a bit of everything. England doesn't have it all. France doesn't have it all. It's bad enough off with Pierre Boulez. Germany doesn't have it all, but America has it all. As a matter of fact, even the composers I've compared with, we have to draw on Germany and England and France. And we have some typically and uniquely American. Uh, basically, we have melodists, people who are more interested in content than they are in structure. Copeland, Gershwin, and Virgil Thompson. Copeland, I mentioned, was really our version of Vaughan Williams, extremely interested in national music, folk music, Appalachian songs, cowboy songs, you heard that last week. Gershwin is our version of Kurt Weill, writing for the Broadway stage, but in such an exceptionally brilliant manner that, that uh, scholars take some notice of him. And Virgil Thompson, who's still alive, still crusty, still writing articles, very nasty about the 12-tone people. Surrealist, surrealism is uh, in art, when it go, takes objects that we all are familiar with, like watches and drapes them over fences or beans and have them out in a, beans the size of elephants out with giraffes in a field, and you uh, see, look, look like beans, but uh, not with giraffes. They transform something of the past. And in England, we had Maxwell Davies, who transformed whom? <coughs> Shakespeare rubbish. Beethoven. <laughs> My boy, this is on film. <laughs> they Handel's Messiah. A not unfamiliar work to many of us. All right. <laughs> I'm just going to put this on, and you tell me what school you think this falls into. Shouldn't take too much guessing. That almost should be enough. This was George Rochberg. And George Rochberg is, you know, America's version of Hans Werner Henze. He realized no one likes this stuff. He didn't like it. And he thought, well, there's no point in writing. We have no audience. And speaking of that, I have a quote from George Rochberg. He said, we do not, cannot begin all over again because the past is indelibly printed on our central nervous system. Each of us is part of a vast physical, mental, spiritual web of previous lives, existences, modes of thought, behavior, and perception. I mean, what he's saying here is, ever since we crawled out of the swamp, that sounded good. And... Well, that's not too bad, I think. <laughs> I was just something more aggressive and nasty. That that sounded bad. It's just part of it. Our great, 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 great grandfathers would have said that that's nasty, and presumably our great, 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 great grandchildren will say that's nasty, and that's nice. Yes. 
Then there are the minimalists or hypnotic school that believe that less is more. That goes back to the early part of this century with the architects who believe that less is more, those people who have the all white apartments with the chromium uh, you know, coffee tables and nothing is showing, not a book, no sign that the intelligent life has lived there, whatever. <laughs> uh, as opposed to the serialists who believe that more is more. I think most of us would probably think enough is enough, but <laughs> not this lot. Obviously, none of these, car these categories is, is exclusive. They share things with each other. It isn't in which the melodists are not the least bit interested in structure. If it comes to that, which one of the three melodists was the, the best structuralist? Absolutely, which makes him the greatest composer of the, I mean, one of our most important American composers, absolutely. Uh, of, before Rochberg turned, obviously, Piston was a greater melodist than Rochberg was, you know, and then Carter was, so the, all these categories share something with each other. And Crumb, of all of these people, you know, shares the most with those people. You know, if you could make two categories for people and that kind of thing, but Crumb is very much interested in taking ordinary sounds like a string quartet and adding wires to them and transforming them in some way. This is HPSCHD. The bottom one, 1969. With computer language shares with what other language the fact that it only has vowels? I mean, only has consonants. Acronyms, uh, uh, acronyms have, Verdi is an acronym. Victor Emmanuel Re d'Italia, there are two vowels there, E and I, A, E, I, O, U, Y, and sometimes what? what? Sure. Don't any of you know any language that only has consonants? Welsh has a hell of a lot of consonants. Fort <laughs> what about Hebrew? There are no written vowels. They're all consonants. Not in the Bible. They're all consonants. Which is why you really ought to know that. Yeah. Whose name is that? God's name, yes. Actually, it comes as just an interesting point because of a, of a German scholar mistranslating what that would have been in Hebrew. We've gotten a wrong name ever since the King James Version of the Bible, God's name. How do you get a ya ja sound in German? J. Ya, ja, spelled J-A, ya. Ja. Uh, H is the same thing in German. Himmel, Herr Gott. How do you get a, a W sound? V, right. When are we going? Right. <laughs> In just a few minutes. Right. <laughs> and H. Well, you have to supply your own vowels. There are no rules, no specific rules for supplying vowels. So if you stick the odd E, O, and A in there, you get Jehovah. But if you ever get up to heaven and ask for Jehovah, it'll say, who? <laughs> Jehovah who? <laughs> say, well, that's you know, what we used to call no one up here by that name. <laughs> And you said, what about Yahweh? Oh, yeah. He's up in that big house. <laughs> well, we're through with all of America here and through with our class. And I think you'd have to agree that, that there's no other century than the 20th century that has so, in which the second rate music has been so interesting. I don't think you can say that for any other century. There's nothing quite so boring as second rate Baroque music unless it comes to second-rate classical music. To hear a symphony by Wagenseil all the way through is worse than almost anything by John Cage. But the point is that in the 20th century, even our second-rate music is, you know, is interesting and fascinating in some way. And so musically, a very exciting and happy time to be alive. Okay, goodbye, good luck, God bless you. See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.